Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this episode where I have the absolute pleasure of interviewing Maxwell uh, Olani Khani, who is an academic, a dancer, choreographer at the UCT um, School of Dance. He's also a um, doctorate fellow um, and just an amazing human being. And so I'm really excited to talk to him. And uh, I'm going to just jump in and, and let uh, ask uh, Olani some questions. Just for everyone out there, what is it to decolonize African dance and what is it to decolonize dance? Well, um, to decolonize African dance specifically is um, trying by all means to put Africa and its people and its dancers in the center of the study to be the primary factor of the study, not to be secondary. And by doing so, you're looking at how you are teaching it. You're teaching it within an Afrocentric understanding and paradigms of it. You remove the five, six, seven, eight of you start to bring the language itself to maybe Anguni language of maybe it's born right here in Africa. And uh, the way you te we teach dances and how our dances can be adopted into a studio pattern within the African eye line of doing dance. And uh, when, when people start to think about these things of what you mean by African, African. I think somewhere, somehow the other thing that is disturbing, which makes us to really decolonize this, which is made by colonial understanding of what African dance is, is the fact that African dance itself has evolved. It has its African contemporary version. It has the urban life, high lifestyle. It has quite a lot. And when people want to talk about African dance, they always reference indigenousness of it. As, as like the rural kind of dance, which is the one that is popular within the tourist gaze situation. So uh, to remove all of that and bring people to an educated understanding of really how African dance can be looked within the lens of Africa itself, then outside comes in, which will be the secondary. When we talk about African dance and the way it should be decolonized we are not excluding the diaspora or the diaspora, which is the African-American, the black people in, in the UK, the Jamaicas, the, you, you name it, the Caribbean side, all of that, it's inclusive within it. And the other reason of decolonizing it, people think that when talk about African dance have to stick to the continent itself, that's it. But decolonizing will open up those conversation and educate people from inside, outside. And the other issue of decolonization is the fact that we're looking at Africa with the African scholars and the diaspora, not mostly across the Atlantic looking through Africa writing about us. So all of these uh, discourses are the ones that um, are en encouraging us. And when we talk to the students, the power invested in this issue of uh, or this matter of the, the, the urgency of decolonization of African dance, especially within institutions and uh, colleges and within schools. If you look into the curriculum of the schools, when they lo you look at let me just zoom it into South Africa particularly, um, because African dance is, um, is a subject in most schools. Thank that. All right, and, and uh, you look into how the curriculum is written for the high school and all of that. It's, more, it's very Eurocentric. It's like uh, you teach African dance in within a Western eye. The funny part, in Africa though. So, um, for, so, so which means I think the argument starts from the fact that uh, has there been somebody who, who really writes a curriculum that is within an Afrocentric paradigm that serves Africa? And what does that mean? You know, so uh, yes, there is, there are some people who have done it, but I think some, somehow they're overshadowed with 99.9% .9 of European Western ideologies of dance that penetrated African dance to save us who can't write apparently about ourselves. What does Western dance look like to you, honestly? A Western dance will be, um, it's an articulation of Western belief and understanding how movement should look like, but using a Eurocentric paradigm of looking at the body, the skin body, the skinny body, um, a very flexible body, a split person and, uh, and, uh, and the analogy of the movement itself, how it should look like in order to be called appropriate. All right, all those, uh, those uh, 
understanding how it should look like and how you should warm up before you dance and how they all coming from the West. And so, and how you should eat as a dancer coming from the West and how to define space and how to look into this is the only front, this is your audience and yet we're coming from the audiences all around us. So all of those norms are coming from Europe and, and then all of that. And I love ballet. I grew up doing ballet as well to nurture my body and understand. But one thing that I never maybe I should say uh, to submissive to it is to, to be able to tell stories that are not relevant to me. It's like I remember coming to those performances uh, um, once a year, twice a year performances, and I, I, I cried actually. I probably every time I went because one, because as you say, it was a three sixty degree performance where people were on stage, off stage, and where the relationship between the audience and the dancers was so alive, and there was so much sound and movement between the audience. So it wasn't a frozen audience with kind of frozen dancers performing and everything had to be perfect. And the one thing that really stood out for me, and I'm, I want to ask you about this, was if there was, there, were, there was a lot of real feelings, hard feelings and good feelings, but there was also so much joy at those performances. And I want to ask you, is joy something that is much more particular to African dance than, it, than you find in Western dance? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I, there, there is joy in, in, in Western dance, just like there is a lot of joy in African dance. I always joke with the students, I said to them, in order to master it, somehow you have to make a fool of yourself. If you go to the shopping mall and you're going to buy groceries, those are the long aisles. What are you standing for? You've got your sugar right there. You've got your thing there. If you're doing zingly a one, two, under one, under one, two, under one, practice has a sugar under one, two, under one, woo, re coffee, oh, coffee, two, a one, two, one, two, practice right there. So you see, it's, 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 and another thing, it's dance is practical. It's practical. You move going to your friend, you go, you know, you're going over it, you're jamming it. It's a, it's a learning process that's what you do you can't compartmentalize it and put it in that room oh when you go there uh, that's what i'm gonna do when i get out of it oh it's done it doesn't work that way especially with african dance you know there were things that were remarkable to me which was like coming to watch those shows for example and how mm. the dancers were all shapes and sizes and that there was a celebration of that it was like it's not it was non-toxic and I felt like mm. pretty much almost all the Western dance I've ever seen feels like in its bones is a toxic anti-life, anti-body, unhealthy relationship. But mostly, you see, when you look into how Western people um, put these uh, ceilings in terms of like what constitutes a good dancer, what constitutes... Um, a, a, a dancing body should look like. It puts pressure on the students, even if they came uh, weighing 58. There are companies, dance companies that I personally know that in each and every Monday, a student or a learner has to go to a scale and to be weighed. And uh, you get, and in such a way that in dancing environment in a Western uh, way, which came and find its way even in Africa with, uh, with ballet companies, there is a culture or a tradition of smoking because smoking makes you not to be hungry and smoking kind of like, you know, puts the, reverses the body, you know? So there is that culture and uh, you bringing your child to that environment who is going to be uh, 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 you know, part of that culture, who's going to learn those habits, despite that you try to forbid a child who smokes a lot, you forbid a child that is going to be bulimic. All of a sudden, your, your child eats dinner and goes to the bathroom, you know, so those are all the cultures that are coming from a Western demeanor, you know, within African dance and African dancing body, we embrace all dances and dances and the bodies. We are not judgmental or we don't have a ceiling that defines a, a good body. You know, we look, you, you execute the body, the movement according to how your body is situated on you. You know, 
it's simple as that within us. It's amazing when you find out a lot of white people as well, just generalizing as well, if I may use that, um, that they only start singing when they go to the church. And mm -hmm. others, they start singing when they mimic their favorite musician. To us, most of the time, <laughs> <laughs> we sing about everything. Sometimes it's just a joke. We sing, we make a joke, we make a song about everything. I always make this joke in, in the class when we teach the Southern part uh, of African, the, the traditional dances. And I always make this joke says, yo, in South Africa, we've got one, uh, one actually people that actually we know, they, 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 we saw, we call it ukamba, meaning to, to ukamba is to create a, a, a song to write mm -hmm. a song and to initiate a song. It didn't exist, but the Zulu people can actually come, but they can talk about it. The cockroach will pass there and say, Ooh, le cockroach, hey. How le cockroach, is on shupang, is ambela. Ah, you know, and then we make a joke about it and then we follow and we sing and we make fun of it. So, <laughs> and if you find, my mother way back used to do a washing before washing machines, you know, doing the washing manually, you know, she will sing. She will sing and she will do it rhythmically, you know, even sweeping. We'll sing. That's something that is inheritance. You know, you're inheriting from sweeping the field in the villages and then seeing her mother doing it and, and stuff like that. You know, but the funny enough part, my daughter sings, she loves singing. She just sings about everything. And she actually, we've got a smart TV. She'll open up the lyrics of the song and she starts singing those lyrics and all and, and stuff like that. Not shy that we're sitting here. We're doing a housework and all. So um, there is some truth into that. Again, being sensitive to generalization, but there is some truth in, generaliz in generalization as well. So um, yeah, most of uh, black people are not shy to think. We're not shy. We are surrounded by activities that requires singing. You know, we go into someone's house who just lost a loved one, a family member. First thing we do, we sing, you know, the whole evening you know, till we bury. We, 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 even we sing when actually the child says, get the grade 12 marks, I've passed, whoa! And then we start singing, you know? So singing is part of, of our celebration. Singing is part of, of our culture and traditions. Singing is part of our ritual. Singing is part of our livelihood. So as dancing. Right, so if you want to know a little bit more about Maxwell Olani Khani, there is a link below. Um, have a look at his work. Uh, it's he's been a real influence on uh, my legs and arms that are dancing a little bit better now. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for making the time to um, to speak to us all today. And I really want to invite everyone to drop comments down below or any questions you have for him, and I'll pass them through and reach out to him via the internet if you want to. Um, you'll find him on Instagram and Facebook uh, and uh, in, in Google. Yeah, so thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, pleasure is all mine, Jeremy. Pleasure is all mine. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Man. Thank you. Thank